Our next speaker is Eliezer Yudkowsky. He's one of my colleagues at the Singularity Institute. He's one of the co-founders and research fellow. He's going to be talking a little bit about the different schools of thought around this notion of the singularity. And Eliezer is probably most well known for a lot of the research he's been doing on what he calls friendly AI. Essentially, how do you work out the theory, the math behind ensuring that you can create a self-improving system that can go through many iterations of improvement in its goal system and actually maintain the original intended goals of that system without it changing what it does you know, over a future either billion iterations or however many you want to consider. There are a lot of complex mathematical issues involved in this. And he wrote a paper in 2001 called Creating Friendly AI, the Analysis and Design of Benevolent, Benevolent Goal Architectures. So he'll be talking about that tomorrow. But right now, he'll be just focusing on the singularity. And he's getting set up here. So just be a few minutes. Good morning. Am I on? So I'm Eliezer Yudkowsky, a co-founder and current research fellow of the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, here to deliver a quick introduction to the singularity and three uh, major schools of thought that have uh, popped up. Back when the Singularity Institute was first starting up, the word singularity got used a lot less often than it does now, and it uh, means a sort of different thing today than it does when the Singularity Institute got started. It's, uh, there's three major uh, schools of thought that have become associated with the word. One that you've all heard of already, I'm sure, is Ray Kurzweil's Accelerating Change. There's also Werner Vinge's Event Horizon and I.J. Goode's Intelligence Explosion. And I'll start off with Accelerating Change. Stripped down to its core essentials, Accelerating Change thesis is that human intuitions about the future are linear, but technology change feeds on itself and therefore accelerates. People instinctively expect around as much change in the future as they've seen in the past, if not less. But technological progress feeds on itself. The more we learn, the more we learn. So the future will contain more technological change than people expect. There's also a bolder version of accelerating change, which says that technology change is smoothly exponential, so we can predict the date when new technologies will arrive. These are the manifold variations of Moore's law for the speed of the fastest supercomputers. Transistors per square centimeter, operations per second per thousand dollars, all doubling every year or two years or 18 months. Here we see a graph of the fully generic uh, version of Moore's law, which shows techno juju increasing exponentially over time. As you can see, the amount of techno juju we have is going up by a factor of 1,000 every 15 years. If we extrapolate this trend into the future, what do we get? That's right. Big juju. As you can see from this graph, we're going to cross the threshold of big juju in, tw in 2031 on April 27th between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> now, not even the bold claim is actually that bold, of course. The real argument goes something like this. If you look back at the rise of the internet from the perspective of the man on the street, the internet blew up out of nowhere. There's a sudden huge spike in the number of internet users on a linear graph. On a logarithmic graph, the increase looks much more steady. So an accelerationist would say, there's no use in acting all surprised by your business model blowing up. You had plenty of warning. The core thesis of accelerationism is that huge changes are coming larger than you'd expect from linear thinking. And the bold thesis is that you can actually time the breakthroughs. Criticisms of the bold thesis don't necessarily hit the core thesis. Com computing progress could be only roughly exponential. Too bumpy to predict exactly, but roughly exponential progress still means you're going to get hit with huge changes somewhere down the line. Any positive second derivative implies future changes larger than past changes. So criticizing Moore's law is not a knockdown argument against accelerating change. And now for something completely different. The event horizon, which is what Werner Vinge originally named the singularity back in the 1970s. Sometime in the future, technology will advance to the point of creating minds that are smarter than human through brain-computer interfaces or purely biological neurohackery or by constructing a true artificial intelligence. 
Werner Vinge was a professor of mathematics who also wrote science fiction, and he realized he was having trouble writing stories set in a future past the point where technology creates smarter than human minds. At, because he was having to try to write characters who were smarter than he was. And at that point, his crystal ball cracked through the center. This is why Werner Vinge originally called it the singularity after the center of a black hole where 1970s models of the laws of physics broke down. Note that it's the model of the future that breaks down, not necessarily the future itself. If I am ignorant about a phenomenon, that is a fact about my own state of mind, not a fact about the phenomenon itself. Something happens, we just don't know what it is. Stripped to its bare essentials, the core thesis of the event horizon is that smarter than human minds imply a weirder future than flying cars and amazing gadgets with lots of blinking lights. Imagine, if you like, that future te technology finally produces the personal jetpack that lets you fly all around the city. Well. Birds flew before humans did, but they didn't take over the world. The rise of the human species did not occur through flapping our arms. In our skulls, we each carry three pounds of slimy, wet, gray stuff corrugated like crumpled paper. The brain doesn't look anywhere, anywhere near as impressive as it is. It doesn't look big or dangerous or even beautiful. But a skyscraper, a sword, a crown, a gun, all these popped out of the brain like a jack from a jack-in-the-box. A space shuttle is an impressive trick. A nuclear weapon is an impressive trick, but not as impressive as the master trick, the brain trick, the trick that does all other tricks at the same time. Usually when you say intelligence, people think of book smarts, like doing calculus. Success in the human world takes more than book smarts. There's also persuasiveness, enthusiasm, empathy, strategic thinking, musical talent, rationality, thinking on your feet. But notice that every factor I just listed is cognitive. Political strategizing happens in the brain, not the kidneys. You won't find many famous politicians or military generals who are monkeys. Intelligence, you might say, is the foundation of human power. It's the strength that fuels all our other arts. In everyday life, think of, people think about the scale of intelligent minds as if it ran from village idiot to Einstein. But this is a range within humans who are themselves the smartest creatures on the planet. If you can take an IQ test designed for humans, you've already established yourself as a member of the cognitive elite no matter what you score, because a mouse would just eat the IQ test. <laughs> yeah. So when I talk about intelligence, I'm talking about the trans-species scale. The scale that starts with a rock at zero intelligence and runs from there to flatworms, to insects, to lizards, to mice, to chimpanzees, to humans. At the core, Vinge's event horizon is about intelligence. Improving the brain is a very serious business. It tampers with the roots of the technology tree, goes back to the cause of all technology. And that makes the future a lot stranger than strapping on a jetpack. If you want to know the true shape of the future, don't be distracted by amazing gadgets with lots of blinking lights. Look to the cognitive technologies, the technologies that impact upon the mind. The bolder thesis of the event horizon, the stronger claim, is that to predict anything a transhuman mind would do, we would have to be at least that smart ourselves. If this is true, the future becomes absolutely predictable and our models, absolutely unpredictable, and our models break down entirely. Now, you might ask, if the future beyond the event horizon is absolutely unpredictable, or even just really weird because there are transhuman minds around, could we still predict that Moore's Law would continue at the current pace? Here we see the shadowed graph of Moore's Law. The increase of techno-juju continues at the current pace until we have enough techno-juju to create smarter than human minds, and then we don't know what happens after that. So the event horizon thesis tends to argue against the bold thesis of accelerating change. We can't predict the future precisely but via smooth exponential graphs. But the core thesis of accelerationism is just that future changes will be greater than past changes because technological change feeds upon itself. And that the event horizon the uh, thesis definitely supports. So the event horizon supports the core thesis of accelerationism, but argues against the bold thesis. And this is why it's important to disentangle all these concepts. 
Another disentanglement, the event horizon does not require